Before we dive into today's episode, we have a special announcement. Coming up this August is the very first Practice of Being Seen retreat. We'll be welcoming a gathering of 13 therapist healers to join us in New York's breathtaking Catskill Mountains for what we're calling Revision. Explore your stories, shape your future. This is a time to dive deep into self-care, into your stories, and into all that you hope to manifest coming this fall and into the year ahead. For more information, please visit us at www.practiceofbeingseen.com slash events. The Practice of Being Seen is about understanding who you really are and daring to share your truth with the world. This is a conversation with and for seekers, creators, and holders of transformation. We believe that stories shape relationships and relationships shape stories. This is Rebecca Wong, relationship therapist and founder of Connectfulness. And this is Marisa Gowdy, writer and storytelling coach for healers. And this is the practice of being seen. The information on this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Today we have Allison Perrier with us. She is an LCSW with a nearly diagnosable obsession with business development. She, start, she has started practices in three different cities and wants you to know that building a private practice is shockingly doable when you have a plan and support. Mm-hmm. Welcome, Allison. Thanks so much for having me, you guys. We are so excited to dive in today with you to like what entrepreneurship is and what it means to build a life that really calls out to who you are and how you show up in the world. Awesome. I'm into that. Let's do it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? I, I'm remembering a particular story we were chatting about, um, just before we started recording the podcast today. Um, the story about when you first kind of stepped into this, this space where you guide others in their private practice journey. Can you share that story with us a little bit? I love it. Sure. Well, we had just moved back to the Southeast. Um, We've been kind of ping-ponging around the country, and we knew we were putting down roots. I'd built a, a practice, or I was in the process of building a practice, and it was going really well. And there was a networking event um, that happened to be on my birthday. So I still remember August 20th. Um, There's a networking event for all the women therapists in my new city, Asheville, North Carolina. And so I went to it, and there were about 60 of us there. And someone had asked the question that, that we would all go around and answer um, something around, like, what do you love about what you do, and who do you serve? And you know how, I mean, maybe this isn't everyone, but when this happens, these like go around the room in large groups and say the thing, I'm always kind of like, okay, what am I going to say? And I come up with something so that my anxiety is reduced enough that I can listen to everybody else talk. But I got so into what everyone else was saying that whatever clever thing I'd come up with totally evaporated when it came to me. And what came out of my mouth was, I really love helping people start private practices, um, which was like not a thing I was really doing outside of just helping my friends across the country. Um, but it just came out of my face. And all of a sudden, I had um, a lot of attention. I mean, there were people who were like, tell me more from across the room. And um It actually is what started my business. It's like the origin story of Abundance Practice Building is this this beautiful networking event. I love networking. And it was on my birthday. And this surprising thing came out of my mouth. And from from that one networking event, I had enough people interested to start a group. And so I started building curriculum and then started the group. So, yeah. Uh, (laughs) So... What I hear in that story, besides the fact that you said origin story, which makes the storyteller and me go, ooh, but (laughs) it's also the fact that you were so enraptured by the moment, you couldn't help but listen so fully that you forgot about that plan of preparing what to say and what you're going to say next in a circle. And that's the magic right there that launched your business was being so in the listening state yeah. that you didn't have to perform. Mm-hmm. You just spoke from something deep within. 
Right. And the me up till that point in my life, and, and I feel like I've evolved a lot in the last few years, but the me up till that point, um, that was an, um, an unknown entity, this whole like going with the moment. I was much more planful than I am now. I was much like it was rooted in anxiety and a little, a little bit of distrust in myself, which I didn't acknowledge at the time, but in retrospect, I can see. And so to have this moment of being purely in the moment and just letting whatever moved through me move through me. Um, yeah, it, it created this, this, this business, which in some ways is one of the loves of my life. Mm. <laughs> you know what I just kind of, ado- oh, I adore it when we, we make hear that moment. <laughs> you know, one of the most rewarding parts of this podcast is when we sit down and we're like, oh, well, this one's going to be more business focused. And then within the first 25 seconds, we're talking about magic and just dropping into to things that are bubbling up from within. Into trusting yourself and letting yourself just be in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Allison, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, you guys hold that space so well. It's just like, I kind of step into it. I'm like, oh yeah, this is all like this beautiful truth. So mm. yeah. Mm. Okay. So let me get back on track here a little bit. <clears throat> um, one of the things that we really like to do is we like to talk about transformation. You know, we're talking to people who are really good at holding transformational spaces for others, um, transformational professionals, and people who are just really interested in transforming their lives. And this is something that you do in multiple ways. You know, you are a therapist and you work with people in their own transformation, but you're this private practice builder. You help clinicians build their private practices and their livelihoods and create deep, meaningful transformation in their lives that helps them build their lives and their businesses kind of structured in the way that they want to live. Mm -hmm. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, how, how did you become this person who, who holds all the space for transformation? <laughs> it's interesting as you say that because it's um, it's a very complimentary way of viewing what I do. I, I believe it to be true, but it's not how I'm not often patting myself on the back like, look at all this transformation you're holding. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to like just absorb that and feel it for a second. Um, I think that's that, rich territory right there, isn't it? Yeah, to that's say pretty rich. Right there, mm-hmm. it didn't occur to you that mm. that was exactly what's happening, and how can we help you reframe? that work. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Honestly, I think so much of my life has been, um, this, um, back and forth, kind of this duality of wanting to be in control, um, wanting to have a say and also really wanting to go with the flow and trust. And I, I see this like throughout, like even from childhood on up to now, this um, this ping ponging back and forth. It's a lot more gentle now, and I kind of stop the fake control stuff early because I'm like, yeah, that's not real. Um, but that idea of the semblance of control, and I think to some extent my personality type and the way that I've been living my life um, throughout much of it, um, it, it feels like a really simple fit. Like let's all pretend like we have control. It feels so much nicer, but it doesn't, obviously. Um, so I, I think transformation is, is something that I've been playing with probably since my teen years. Um, and, you know, my teen years being a teenager, it was mostly focused on myself. But I think once I realized in my 20s that, that therapy, which truly saved my life, realizing that therapy was something that um, created something I didn't know was possible for myself, I wanted to share that. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm real big on, on resources, right? And I felt like all of a sudden I had all these resources to enjoy my life and to not fall into patterns that didn't, didn't help me in any way. Um, and realizing what was possible was so inspiring that I wanted everybody else to have that chance too. And that's when I became a therapist. So... Yeah. And then seeing the spider web effect of like, I help somebody start a practice that they really love going to and they now have the time and the energy and the finances to take great care of themselves. And so they're doing 
better clinical work than they have ever done in their life and how that impacts their clients and how that impacts their clients' relationships with people. There's just this really beautiful spider web of, um, you know, people taking great care of themselves. Because if we're not taking care of ourselves as transformational professionals, as healers, as therapists, we can only take our clients as far as we've gone ourselves. You, you know, you can't walk someone somewhere that you've never been. Right. You can't guide them there. Mm. So that's a piece of this work too. It's, it's doing that part of the work yourself so that you could take someone else there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I know you and I have, have had the opportunity to get to know each other a bit over the past few, I don't know how long years. Um, <clears throat> and as we've been getting to know each other, our personal lives kind of keep showing up in those conversations. You know, we, um, I remember one of, was it one of our first conversations was around shopping for houses? Yeah, I was, we were shopping for houses. <laughs> and I think I just threw out in my Facebook group, like, if anybody wants to niche in helping people navigate the identity crisis it is to find a house, because I'm mm-hmm. like, I love the energy of the city. And I'm very, I'm a very energetic person. But I need the woods to survive. And so I was right. like, do I get a, a place in town? Do we move out to the country? And I was, I was really having a hard time making the decision. Um, because I felt like whatever I chose was deciding a thing about me that I was really committing to. Um, right. And over identifying with it ultimately is is what I realize now. Yeah, yeah. And I was I was going through a phase at, at that point where I was trying to decide if I was going to stay in my current house or move to another place. And um, I was in my own bit of something. So I remember connecting with you over that, and it was just such a rich a rich opportunity for connection. So Absolutely. I want to thank you for for that again. Um, Thank you, you know, man. Really, seriously. Yeah. <laughs> What's interesting that comes through that little tiny anecdote is that that's another kind of sense of duality of that country city. And you were talking before about, you know, control versus trust and flow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so much of transformation comes when we can ride those tensions. Mm-hmm. When we can be both or well, give ourselves permission, permission to, be to, both. to be both. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How are you watching that kind of come through people in your work as you're holding entrepreneurs? What's that, what does that show up as for a lot of people? Oh, that's a good question. I think in order to go into business for yourself, there has to be something inside you saying like, you know what, I can do this. I can, I can do this. Like I have the skills it takes. And then, um, (laughs) and then we kind of start and we get, uh, kind of smacked in the heart sometimes when we don't take off at the at the rate that we'd hoped. So there's then this piece that comes in that says, absolutely, I am a failure and I'm never going to make this work. And I was foolish to even try. And I've now embarrassed myself um, and I'm filled with shame about it. And I see that that duality and almost everybody I've ever worked with. And I've certainly felt it myself over and over again in business. Um, and so I think that there's this this piece of this kind of dialectical holding of, yes, you can absolutely make it. And sure, you absolutely feel like a failure right now. Um, it doesn't mean you are a failure. This is part of the process. Um, it's a tough part of the process. But man, I, having... I've started three practices in three different states now. I have an international online business. There is little that I don't think I can do at this point. (laughs) You know, like including write out all those awful moments of feeling like I should just bury my head in the sand and and not show my face in society again. You know, like Mm -hmm. I know that's going to come again and again and again in my life. The more I show up and be seen. Mm-hmm. I'm and gonna it, have it that. happens at your growth edges. It happens at the points where you're, you're pushing yourself a little bit. You're doing something that's a little bit new. You're, you know, like for me in my practice, I'm for the first time ever, I have a wait list. Mm-hmm. And this is like a whole new space for me to be in. And, and I'm like trying to figure out how to navigate it. And what does this mean? And how do I do this now? And um, am I okay with having a wait list? Like, there's a whole bunch of questions that come up for that kind of stuff for me. I'll come on to your podcast. We'll talk about that. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, 
you know, it, I find that this stuff happens, it happens with growth edges. It happens with the, with the expansions, with the places that we're leaning into. Yeah. And just to add something to the duality side, it also happens when we're afraid to grow mm-hmm. and we're in that place of saying, I haven't allowed any movement lately because I have been burying my head in the sand or at least lying my head on the earth in a way that isn't necessarily nurturing, but more like (laughs) considering if I just dig a little more of a hole, maybe no one will notice me and my business will just melt. (laughs) Whoops, Mm -hmm. where to go? I I think there's there's both sides of that because we need to honor that sometimes I'm not at a growth edge and that doesn't feel good too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like you get you get used to it. You get used to the growth and there's a sense of pride of like, look at all this I'm shouldering, like Mm. good for me for being here. Um, That then when you're kind of coasting, (laughs) it's good to appreciate that. But sometimes I do get that like, wait, does this mean I'm stagnant? What's happening? Right. And I think that happens in a lot of our online communities too, when people are looking around at their peers and their colleagues and saying, oh my gosh, you have an online program. You have a this, you have a that. Oh, I don't. Mm. The judgment. Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, and how much holding has to happen to have people from all different spaces still feel welcome and say, you know, where you are right now is where you are. Let's help you grow or let's help you hold this current growth edge. Let's see you where you are and have this still be a shared container of transformation. Because I know you have your own online community as does the practice of being seen. That's a huge part of the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I actually just wrote a blog post about about comparison yesterday, because I keep seeing it in all these different contexts. And people are looking for um, an example that they can follow and have the exact same success. It's that control piece, right? Like, if you can tell me how long it took you to get full, then I can follow the same steps and get full in the same exact way. And that relieves the tension of not knowing. But I mean, obviously, there are a million different factors that that are going to contribute to somebody filling a practice or, or getting busy in their business or whatever that looks like, that it's not transferable. You know, the timeline is not transferable. I'm, I'm dropping into a few words that you just said. You were talking about the tension of not knowing, mm. you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of like feeling my way into that because those words, I, I think they describe so much of the human experience. Yes. I think it's also another word for entrepreneurship. <laughs> they may not have listed that in the thesaurus yet, but I think in the next edition, T O, you're a T O N K. Oh, you're an entrepreneur. You have the tension of not knowing. I got it. <laughs> oh, so much so. And I, I think that probably brings us really beautifully into a conversation around how, how this journey into entrepreneurship also is a journey into the self. Mm. How, it, how it has you looking at and examining different parts of who you are and what you value and why you, I mean, why is such a big question in entrepreneurship, right? And right. in everything we do. Um, can you want to talk into that a little bit, Allison, about the, the places where those, those pieces kind of merge a little bit? Hmm. Like what, what have you noticed that... Um, that budding entrepreneurs are learning about them themselves as, as humans, as people, as. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a confidence that once you're, once you've sat through the pain enough in this, in this one context over and over, you realize you can handle it. And that's, I mean, that's, that is transferable, right? Like that's something we can transfer to other discomforts in our life is it's something we can sit through. We know that we have, the experience in sitting through discomfort, um, the trusting yourself. One thing I end up seeing, interestingly, once people are really rolling along, and I find myself here a lot, is looking for that next challenge, right? I finally got into a place in my business where things are more predictable. I know my groups are going to fill. I know um, my e-courses are going to sell a certain amount, like this, this, thing all of a sudden that felt like this nebulous, you can't count on anything space is now very predictable in my business, which is exactly what I wanted. But I'm not comfortable resting there because I'm like, well, now I've gotten really comfortable with the fear of not knowing what's happening next. And so 
I'm going to keep creating things so that I can keep walking that line because there's a rush to it once I can handle it. And so I see other people getting there. Like once their phone is ringing consistently and they've got full caseloads, they get, I call it business board, kind of like what's what's next? Um, and that's a fun thing to play with because the folks who are wanting to explore something different or explore a growth edge, I don't know, like that's that's the entrepreneur brain, right? The somewhat sensation seeking, um, creative, um, ambitious with the good connotation, not the bad one, um, person that wants to keep growing. Mm. And I'm, I'm playing with the duality there that, that you've talked about again between resting and rushing, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, between being bored and wondering what's next. Like there's these dualities keep showing up in this conversation, the space to kind of hold both. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know what I'm thinking of? I know you've just recently re- released a product about doing scripts for therapists to help mm-hmm. them in, I guess, would be like typical slash challenging conversations. Is that a good way to kind of classify it? Yeah, yeah. As, oh, so, and as I'm thinking about that, it brings again to that other duality of a need to be able to control what is going to be, in certain ways, a very uncomfortable potential situation where you don't know what they're going to say next, but you have something to rely on. Mm -hmm. And that just makes me think about how introducing certain structures that can hold us, enable us to walk through these dualities in a way that's much more comfortable and get to that word you've said several times too, which is just trusting yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a girl who loves structure, right? (laughs) Like, I, that's actually something I have to be very careful of is not allowing things to get too structured for myself because then I go into my old habit of being rigid about things, which is a lot less fun. Um, and I'm really like, that's my growth edge right now in my life is allowing for more fun. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I'm a fun person, but I find that I've been prioritizing a lot of things over just whatever I might happen to find fun on a Wednesday, you know? So that's been actually, we just went, we had a cabin weekend, my husband and I, and my parents watched the kids and we spent this really beautiful weekend in the mountains this weekend. And I, I literally just sat down and thought about like, what is fun to me? Why has this not been a priority? And just explored like, what does fun look like as a 37 year old woman? Cause it doesn't look like it did when I was 22 and it's probably going to look really different when I'm 60, but like, what is my identity as um, an entrepreneur, as a mother, as a partner, as a friend, as a daughter, as a daughter-in-law, like these identities that are really important to me, how do I uphold all of those while also allowing for what I know in my soul I need, which is more fun? Mm -hmm. I recognize myself in that 100% down to the year of birth. Just seriously. (laughs) So, um, you know, the the universal is found in the specific. In this case, you have pretty much exactly the same specifics. High five. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, one of the things that came up as I'm listening is the word identity. It's something that you've you've brought into this conversation a few times. It's um, one of one of the tensions of not knowing keeps coming back to identity. Hmm. Right. In, in lots of different ways in our lives, like how do I have fun? What kind of business person am I? Am I someone who thrives or am I someone who fails? Am I like all of these different ways? Um, this seems to be one of those tensions that keeps showing up. Who hmm. am I? Yeah. And it's funny because we we think as as grown women, like there's this sense of knowing who we are. And I believe that to be true. And the tension, the duality of like the places where we feel less secure or um, more vulnerable. And that's still a part of our identity, but sometimes owning that feels really scary. Mm. Mm. I know as I'm hearing this too, it makes me think about that um, kind of a love-hate dual dual relationship with labels. And I know we, Rebecca and I were at a seminar with Jonathan Fields last summer, and he talked about the fact that there's power in Naming yourself, because if you don't claim something, other people will label you. And, and they're not always going to get it right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And that struck a chord with me because I've always been a person seeking, I am a blank. 
And yet, throughout my entire life, I've resisted that. Um, you know, I worked in academic libraries, but never had my library degree. I spend almost all my waking hours with therapists, but I'm not a therapist. Mm. And there are times when I get very envious of sitting beside the person who has the professional degree that says, I'm a therapist, this is who I am. But of course, you go deeper and understanding everyone's identity is incredibly multi-layered. And f- certainly just because you have an LCSW behind your name or whatever your credentials are, doesn't necessarily plant you in like, and now I'll never have another identity crisis again. I'm solid. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> So it's good to reflect, reflect that, you know, it happens on both sides of the fence, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And maybe yeah. even more so with therapists, because we're just so trained to keep looking deeper and looking deeper, which mm-hmm. I think creates some more um, identity question or identity qu- crisis. So, yeah, I think that there's, there's not a whole lot of solid stuff going on over here, at least. So. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you have to make up your own job title, you are still... Uh, we're all riding the same wave, I guess. We're all riding it. Yeah. yeah. And I liked yeah. what you said about what Jonathan Fields said about like, you have to define yourself so others don't define you. Um, I had a yeah. troll get into my Facebook group, um, which we've tightened up the, the systems now and it won't happen again. But he was essentially just like, he was calling me a liar. And my brand is built. I mean, I would say one of the pillars of my brand is authenticity and it's okay to show up and be imperfect. And so to be called a liar struck so deeply. Like I, I shook for hours. Mm -hmm. Um, It was really like, I was really upset about having been in my safe space, right? This group of people who are super loving and super kind and really generous with their ideas and their thoughts with one another to be called out in a way like that was, um, it's so disconcerting. I don't need, there's a much more harsh word I can't think of, but um, it was really interesting to me how strong my reaction was and how, um, like what contributed to that stronger reaction when I knew like, I know I'm not a liar and I wasn't lying about anything. Um, but yeah, having to go back into the group, like I still have blog posts that he was trolling and I didn't approve his comments, so they didn't show up. But it was really like I still haven't gone into my my WordPress site to approve comments. I've got like 50 comments waiting on me, but I'm like afraid to go in still, which is so interesting because like he's a stranger who clearly has some problems with himself. Like, mm-hmm. why does it matter? So, right. And he's leading with his own shadow. Absolutely. And then that offers you and everyone in your community the opportunity to see the shadow sign of being seen. Mm hmm. Yeah, and I've had haters before, but he's definitely the most vehement that I've encountered. And it's like, I I feel like I've spent most of my life trying to be honest and good and true and whatever that's meant in the moment, you know, and and helpful. Like, that's one of the tenets of my personality is like, I really, really want to be helpful. So um, it's interesting how, though I've been being seen for a few years now, this is the first time that it struck me this deeply. Mm-hmm. Right. And the interesting lesson in that seems to be too, that it was truly out of your control in that situation. It wouldn't have mattered how perfect your copy was or how exemplary your messaging was around yourself. Mm-hmm. He wasn't there to see that. Right. Right. He wasn't, he wasn't looking for it, you know, and I think this also just kind of brings me into some of the, the stuff that Brene Brown talks about. You know, I've, I've, gotten to to see her speak some and I've gotten I've watched some of her other talks and she often talks about when you know when we're putting ourselves in that arena when we're putting ourselves out there and we're we're showing up that there are going to be people who just want to take us down that that's their agenda mm-hmm. and so but but often the thing that we're even more afraid of is the voices that are in our head the things that we're telling ourselves before we even get to that place of going out there and talking. But then these people like, like this guy show up and they, they make those voices in our head even louder, Mm -hmm. you know? So, um, they make us judge ourselves more next time and they make us look a little deeper at, you know, well, is, is there any accuracy to, to what, 
what they're claiming? Is there, you know, is this true? Is this really who I am? Is this how I show up in the world? And they, they plant all this doubt, which brings us to this place where it's even harder to get that solid ground and, and just trust ourselves and trust the message that we're bringing into the world. Yeah, it's true. Because while I knew what he was saying that I was lying about wasn't the truth, I was like, are there parts of me that are liars? Have I lied to my community? Have I done something wrong? And like the guilt and shame of like, I don't know what if there is and like somehow he knows this or sees this even though I don't. Um, yeah, I think it tapped into a lot of fear. But I, and I guess if you can be, you can hold yourself, you can find those to hold and support you. Those are portals into asking those really deep questions to know, no, I know for sure. Yeah. I know who I am and who I'm rooted into. And thank you, dear troll, for right. giving me this opportunity <laughs> into my own shadow spaces I wasn't quite ready to see. Yeah, yeah. And then there were beautiful parts too. Like I was trying to stay off Facebook, right? Because mm. living your life on Facebook isn't the healthiest thing for fun. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I had like 10 or 15 people in my community send me private messages being like, heads up, there's bad stuff going on. Um, and including like some other practice builders who are in the community, just like these really loving people in my group who wanted me to know that they had my back. So it actually strengthened your community ultimately. Ultimately. Mm -hmm. The bonds you know you had with them. Yes. Yeah, and it helps you put structures in place too, which... Mm -hmm. Yeah, now I've got some awesome moderators for the group who, I mean, I don't think I realized how much time I was spending just with like some of the small tasks in the group that I'm like, oh, it's five minutes here. But it was hours, Mm -hmm. hours every week. And now I've got help with that. And that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go have fun during those hours now. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. And I think that's part of like the entrepreneur's evolution. And it may come out in different ways, but I think those of us who are in the community moderating role or those of us who just started to really feel the social media burn and time suck – Part of the evolution is to start to say, like, I have permission to step away from my baby a little bit and to find some babysitters, to find some loving hands. And, you know, I think that's one of those things you can hear about and read about in a blog post. And until you experience it, Mm -hmm. you don't quite understand that, like, this is me breathing into actually building my business when I can step away and care for myself. And have fun. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, w- I really want to know, what did you do? What was fun this past weekend? What, what was the thing? Yeah, well, so <laughs> this weekend we were in this cabin and it was like on top, of, well, I don't know about on top of a mountain, but we had an amazing view and mm. my husband went mountain biking because that's his favorite thing. And while he was mountain biking, I did an e-course that um, Brene Brown and Glennon Doyle Melton did together um, because like personal <laughs> development is fun. <laughs> Yeah. I love you. <laughs> You're like a soul sister. <laughs> yeah. And then we, like we had a, a few really nice hikes and I love to cook and I made this really amazing gnocchi and yeah, it was great. And then when we came home, we snuggled our girls and yeah. I'm sorry. Did you say, did you say gnocchi or nookie? <laughs> <laughs> Both. Both. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is part of fun, both. Okay, <laughs> oh, how do we come back from that? <laughs> P.S. Rebecca's working on her sex therapy hours right now. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> we just feel the joy. It's totally good. This is what oh, we right. You had a good weekend. I had a great weekend. Yeah. You had a good weekend. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so how do you get more of that in your life? Like, how, how do we all get more of that in our lives? What kind of permission do we need to give ourselves to let go of the control and embrace more of the fun? What's mm. your, what are you coming to? Well, one thing I did this weekend is I made, I, I love lists and structure, right? So um, I just kind of made up a little exercise for myself where I made a list of all the things that I've ever found fun in my adult life, even the ones like that sound awful now, when, like when I was 22. Um, but I made a list of all the things that I've ever found fun in my life that I could think of and all the things that have ever felt restorative in my life that I could think of. And then I also made a list of, of some things that I learned in the course about like, where's your easy button that Brene Brown talks about of like, 
you know, I could have a beer at the end of the day, sure, and that's going to relieve some tension, but that's really an easy button versus Mm. sitting with the emotion of, wow, today was kind of stressful, and figuring out a different relationship with that instead of trying to alleviate it every time. Um, So I also came up with my easy button things so I could be more aware of them. And then I looked through my fun list and I was like, okay, like it's been a really long time since I've sewed. I don't know if I'd still like sewing, but you know what? It's worth a shot. Where can I build that into my schedule to make it happen? Like, do I need to get a, um, like a craft night together with some of my friends? Is that the way to make that happen? Or should I just carve out some of my alone time over the weekend and, and play with it and see what feels good? Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't picked up my guitar in a while. I have an amazing screen porch and like playing my guitar on my screen porch sounds awesome. I should make that happen. And so like trying to connect with the things that were once fun um, through my imagination to see how it felt, like to see how my body responded to it and kind of, I didn't mark them off the list or anything, but being really clear about like what didn't resonate and what did and kind of made a a commitment to myself to build them in. Mm, That sounds beautiful. Yeah, I'm excited about it. <laughs> yeah, I would be too. I think I, I'm going on vacation next week. I think maybe I'll make a list on the plane. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that, Allison. Absolutely. Delightfully easy. Yeah. <laughs> and there's certain things that are simple. Yeah. Oh. I'm just kind of resting in that, and I'm, I'm wondering if that's a really great place for us to wrap up today. Um, you know, with that, that notion of making this list, what... What would make your life feel more fun and just feel good? I like it. Mm, Me too. Allison, I want to thank you for being with us today. And um, is there anything that you'd like to share with our listeners? Where can they find you? Oh, sure. They can find me at AbundancePracticeBuilding.com. I've got lots of resources for people starting businesses, particularly healers and therapists. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you again today. You too. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you. In today's episode, Allison talked a lot about her mountain retreat and the experiences she had there and what she discovered. We'd like to invite you to join us in the mountains. This August 13th through 16th in 2017, we're going to be in the Catskills at the Menla Mountain Retreat. And there we're going to explore what we call revision. Explore your stories and shape your future. For details, please visit us at practiceofbeingseen.com slash events. For more great content, check out practiceofbeingseen.com and spread the word by subscribing, rating, and reviewing the podcast. Music written and performed by Christopher Ferris and produced at Kidneystone Studio.